Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar with Hager on AFTD. My name is Vian Melki. I'm the marketing coordinator at Rexel. Our guests today are Paul Collins and Paul Schaffers, technical training managers at Hager. Please note that this is a recorded webinar and will be available to watch on demand on our Rexel website. This webinar is CPD accredited. Certificates will be sent directly from CPD, which can take up to five weeks. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to pop them in the Q&A box and we will answer them at the very end. Now passing to Paul from Hager. Thank you, Wim. Yeah, and good afternoon, everyone. So introduce myself. I'm Paul Collins. Um, I do have a colleague, Paul Chaffers, who should be attending uh, with me in this webinar and taking some of the uh, some of the topics. Um, he is just having a few connection issues at the moment. So I'm kind of hoping he'll be joining me. Uh, They'll be joining us shortly. So um, Paul and Paul, as we are at, at Hager, um, are the technical technical training managers. Uh, and obviously we uh, produce um, uh, courses like this. We also work with different organizations. Both of us work with BEMA, which is the manufacturers organizations, both on the wine regulations technical committee uh, and Paul on the electric vehicles uh, technical group. And myself, I work with um, IET JPEL. Uh, I'm on committee A which deals with uh, verification issues. Um, so yes, so today's topic is about AFDDs. So firstly, what is an AFDD? Um, well, AFDDs were really kind of um, introduced to us more or less in the 18th edition in 2018, where there was a device uh, recommended for additional protection against fire. There was actually in the 17th edition, but really tucked away in section 532 as a device uh, for protection against fire by mitigating art faults. But it was only a note then, so, you know, it's quite easily missed. So uh, 2018 was when they become uh, prominent. And as we know, they are some changes to the regulations in Amendment 2, which was introduced to us uh, a couple of years ago. So in Amendment 2, we introduced a definition of, of, of the AFDD. So this is the definition you'll find in Part 2. So an art fault detection device is actually the device intended to mitigate the effects of arc faults by actually disconnecting the circuit when it detects this arc fault. So when it detects this arc fault, which is a potential source of ignition of fire, this is when the uh, the AFDD will um, kind of do its job, if you like, is kick in and, um, and, and shut down the circuit and stop that fire from developing. Now, the standard for AFDDs does permit uh, three different versions of AFDDs to be produced. Uh, indent one there you can see is a single device. So literally it would be an AFDD on its own. No other detection uh, technologies inside it, just literally the AFDD technology. Manufacturers, of course, also, or installers, you know, you always have to use overcurrent protection, mostly residual current protection. So mostly manufacturers like Hager as well, have gone with indent two there, a single device, which is an integrated protected device. So we have the AFDD technology as a single device integrated with the other devices you'll need to use, like RCBOs or, or MCBs. Uh, there is indent free actually a separate device assembled on site. So it's kind of the one on the right hand side over there on your screens. So it's the piggyback AFDD that you could piggyback onto a, an MCB, I guess, or, or an RCBO. So there are several options. Okay, most manufacturers that I know uh, have certainly gone with indent number two. So the goal really is to cut down the number of fires we have in the UK. There are still something like 20,000 electrical fires in the UK by a uh, electrical nature or igniter started by electrical nature. So AFDDs hopefully want to do something about this number. Several other devices, of course, um, are do have a, uh, a fire protection, you know, overcurrent, residual current, surge protection devices on the picture, on the picture there do have a, a fire protection property, of course. Uh, but, you know, looking at the pyramid on the right hand side, that kind of the AFDD really tops that off. Nothing we have today or two AFDDs really can do any protection uh, to look for art faults. Those other protection devices OK, will not see an art fault and actually do anything about it, which obviously is that source of uh, ignition. Now, art faults can be uh, two ways, really. You can get series art faults or serial art faults. This is actually essentially the same thing, which is in the picture in the middle there, a 
Sorry, let me just do this, which is in the picture in the middle here. You can see actually the current um, jumping a little gap in the conductor. That's the cause of the arc to get to the load. So the load current will kind of be pushing uh, the, or, 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 or the arc will be being pushed by the load current as such. Okay, so, or it could, they could be parallel in nature. Now this is where you have insulation damage between a conductor at one operating voltage and a conductor at another operating voltage, of course. Imagine the cables getting kind of squashed together or something like that. You know, the insulation's being damaged. Uh, the insulation then becomes conductive enough um, to generate this uh, arc, this arc current between the uh, between the two conductors, it's not too conductive to cause a short circuit, of course, because other devices can handle that. It's that kind of in between place where the conductor is uh, satisfactory or there's a short circuit. Now, this is where um, I would have liked Paul to come in on this one, actually. Uh, it looks like he's still having some uh, some connection issues because uh, my colleague Paul in a previous life was very instrumental in the actual development of the regulations uh, that we have today. The Amendment 2 regulations 421.1.7, whereas in the 18th edition, they was just recommended for additional protection against fire. No specific mention of any kind of um, building type, no specific mention of any kind of circuits as such. So, you know, it was really open to real interpretation what someone wanted to do with that word recommendation. So in um, Amendment 2, after receiving lots and lots of comments uh, through the draft of public comment process, it was decided by the, the that particular committee to focus on socket outlet circuits only. So AFDDs, as you see there, the regulation is changed from uh, from recommended to shall be provided. You know, the word shall be provided makes it pretty much normative, mandatory. Uh, so they need to be provided for socket outlet circuits up to 32 amps, but in focused building types as well. So buildings above, or sorry, residential buildings above 18 meters or six stories. So what we would class as, or defined as high risk residential buildings. HMOs, uh, student accommodation and care homes. So if we're working or designing any of those building types under Amendment 2 regulations, the socket outlets would require the additional protection by art fault devices, as well as, of course, the overcome protection and probably the residual current protection as well. Now, the reason these building types are chosen and specifically for socket outlets is because of the evacuation issues and maybe use and misuse of the uh, of the installation by the occupants of that you can see obviously tall buildings have evacuation issues hmos and student accommodation may have kind of use and misuse of the uh, socket outlet circuits as such or the you know the equipment plugged into socket outlets and care homes again maybe some for some uh, evacuation issues now, they were recommended for uh, under uh, when the original item edition, they still are recommended for other uh, premises for socket outlet circuits. So, you know, they are mandatory in those four areas and recommended for everywhere else, pretty much. Now, recommended, what does recommended mean? The um, Amendment 2 gave us on page 18 a little bit of a guidance on what the, some of the language used in 7671 uh, means really. And you can see that a recommending uh, recommendation has a kind of a verbal translation of should. So it's not a must, clearly, it can't be, it's not a must, uh, but really it should be, you know, they should be used. And but we should have a, a reason really, if we're not going to use them, why we're not using them. So the idea of this table is to make um, designers, installers, Give it a lot more thought to things that are being recommended, not just like I think it's fair to say 90 odd people in the uh, original 18th edition would have said, oh, it's only a recommendation. I don't have to do anything about that. I'm really thinking about it. If that was really true, then it, the, the ink wouldn't be on the pages in the first place. If you don't have to do anything about it, there's no point in those words being in the book. So, OK, so there is some more consideration um, required where we are going to use or not use uh, AFDDs for sockets in other premises. Now, they are um, mandated for sockets in premises, as I've, uh, I've said, uh, um, uh, obviously, already. Um, so 
is there a, a use of these in other premises? Well, yeah, there's no requirement for other circuits in other building types. Okay, but you know, the technology does now, uh, well, we do have the technology to provide this additional protection against fire. And there are certainly some building types you can see on the, uh, the kind of picture there on the screen, you know, if we was designing the electrical installation and that kind of thatched cottage, maybe it'd be a really good idea to add extra fire precautions um, for maybe the lighting circuits it's in the loft or something like that, or, or in other building types where there is, you know, um, more risk of fire or more valuable equipment that will get damaged if there was, was a fire. So there's no reason they can't be used anywhere else, of course, although there's no specific mention in 7671. They are now, of course, widely available in one module for standard distribution boards. You know, uh, we've had them available in single modules now, and so have uh, most other manufacturers. So they can go in standard distribution boards. There's um, little or nothing extra to do for installers. And they can go in um, RCBO form, if you like. So if we was doing this uh, all RCBO uh, protected circuits, then we can install what would be classed as a, a, an RCBO AFDD. Or if we was adding to existing installations or, you know, for some reason, if we still want to use a split load consumer in it, we don't then need an RCBO AFDD. We actually need, you know, an MCB AFDD. So actually we have got similar products that are MCB AFDD rather than, uh, as well as the, the standard RCBO AFDD. So where do we get these art faults? Well, several different ways, of course. Um, rodent damage, you know, especially the last picture of the fat cottage is, will be a particular problem for rodent squirrels, etc. liking to chew our cables. Not sure why they find them so incredibly tasty, but obviously they do. Um, cables can be um, age, you know, solar degradation and things like that can affect the installation of cables, which over time can start leading to arcs between. You can see the main focus for socket outlet circuits, this one in the middle here, where cables are now outside of the, you know, containment or outside of the fabric of the building and are more, of course, uh, subject to uh, damage. You know, flexes get cut, crushed, scraped, etc. And obviously all those damage, all that damage insulation could at some point lead to an arc on a, on a flexible cord that's outside of the, uh, outside of the fixed wire and as such. Damage insulation, loose connections, etc., are all possible methods of, uh, of generating arcs on electrical circuits and cables. Now, when we get arcs form, okay, generally there is some carbonisation, and then the arc is actually a current path. Now that current path is the electrical arc, which can increase more carbonization, which can increase the current, which is the increase of arc, which is increase the carbonization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, we could, once we start striking this arc, be in a downward spiral, if you like. So it's just gonna get hotter and hotter and hotter until at some point, of course, the, the arc temperature is hot enough to actually physically ignite the cable that where the arc is, and obviously then, ignite any other medium around the cable and then you've got a obviously a big problem and you need more than uh, electrical protection of course you need the fire brigade and once it's gone to that place so how do they work okay there's lots of um, 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 theories and issues about how they work so on the right hand side there you'll see like a CAD drawing of our of our AFDD so hopefully some of these pieces at the bottom here will be very familiar to you. You know, this is a MCB stroke RCD, so RCBO as such. You can see so various different components on here which, uh, which do the uh, overcurrent and the residual current functions. Now, what would have been the kind of outgoing terminals on the top of that RCBO device as such then? You can see this arc fault module has been kind of entered on the top. So after the current has gone through the overcurrent and residual current detection process, if you like. You can see then the current is kind of forced through the, uh, the arc fault part of the product. So I've blown that up in here in this picture and it, the current now specifically goes through this secondary measurement core before it gets to the outgoing terminals. Now this secondary measurement core here is not really interested in the value of current coming through the product, okay? That's the MCB's part of the product to do that job. It's not specifically interested in any kind of balance of current coming through the product. You know, if it were an RCBO, that would be the RCD section of the product. 
doing that job. It's this part is interested. What does the current physically look like if I could see it? You know, what kind of frequencies are in this uh, current coming through my this product? When does this when does it change um, from being a normal current coming through the product? Is there a step change which kind of might uh, look like an arc strike and as such? And and as it's doing this measurement, all decision making uh, processes are going on by the microprocessor that's in this section of product. So it's very much uh, you know a software programming type of product where it, it it's looking at physically at what the current looks like coming through the product and see that's normal, that's normal, that's normal. And suddenly I think, oh, hang on a minute, what's this coming through me now? So is this a little bit different? And I will watch that for a little while. So in kind of block diagram form then, if you like, so there's the analog measurement coming through the product, okay? The secondary measurement core. And then there's all sorts of decision-making processes going on in the AFDD. So it's the computing, the what does it look like, the decision-making process, comparing it with things that it already knows, of course, looking at the algorithms programmed into the product before, okay, there's a decision made. So it's not just a simple, quick snap decision it makes, you know, this thing does a lot of, lot of uh, processing and, and um, decision making before it sends the ultimate decision, which obviously will be a trip command. Now a trip command will actually open the actual uh, contacts of the uh, main product itself, as if I can call it a main product. So it'll open the MCV contacts as such. There's no secondary contacts built into here. Secondary contacts are a problem, of course, they will add, well, probably cost for one. There's no there's no need for secondary contacts. And they also will add a lot of heat. As soon as we put contacts in things, we add a lot of heat. So we'd rather use the contacts we already have. So we, we just open the MCV contacts. So now actually what they're actually doing is focusing in really at this point here. So this is a really interesting decision making point for the AFDD. So as the, you know, the AC voltage and current goes through the product, of course, goes through the product, it hits several zeros. So when the voltage is zero, there's no current, there's no arc. Now, as the voltage starts to climb, either positive or negative, at some point then, there'll be an arc striking and there'll be sort of different frequencies for the remainder of that 10 millisecond cycle until the voltage hits zero again, it will extinguish, it will strike again on the next cycle going either positive or negative. So it really kind of analyzes this point very closely. And so it doesn't make one decision at one point. The AFDD doesn't work or need to work in anywhere near the same amount of time that a residual current device is expected to work in. You know, residual current devices have to trip quickly. You know, this could be someone getting a severe electric shock. So it's important that it disconnects quickly. These things can take their time. So they can take up to something like a second to make their decisions to actually trip. OK, now that doesn't sound very long, of course, but there are several zero point crossing decision making opportunities for an AFDD in that one second so you know in their world if you like they're working uh pretty slow in our world obviously they're still working very very fast and as i said before what they do is when it sees these um issues because you know arcs operate or arcs occur in several pieces of equipment or just about every piece of equipment you know it's just simply switching on lights creates arc operating machinery creates arc okay um these are um programmed into the device to say, well, I know that, that's a that's a short time arc, it's a, probably a light switch or something like that switching event, or this is a repetitive arc used in kind of machinery. So all this, all these, all these um, uh, pieces of information are programmed into the AFDDs. So it just ignores what naturally occurs, uh, what's a naturally occurring arc, and only really picks up on what it would see as a, what class as a, a dangerous arc, something that might initiate fire. Now, a few myth busters actually. Um, we are still uh, asked a question and um, still have to um, give an answer about ring final circuits because, you know, we use ring final circuits still quite often in the UK. Um, so there's a question well, do they work on ring final circuits? You know, because we have pretty much parallel conductors on, on, on ring final circuits. So, yes, they do. So I just want to explain that a little bit here. So we've got the AFDD at the start of our ring final circuit. And you can see here three, several or three um, 
kind of opportunities for arc, if you like. So I'm look at this one over here first. So this is trying to show a series arc or serial arc in this cable between this socket and this one. Of course, it could be at the socket terminals as such, but somewhere between here and here, there's an opportunity for a series arc, which essentially means, you know, there's a, a kind of a, a very small break in the conductor, which the load current might want to jump across. Now, this is where the confusion occurs because that can't happen because this conductor, if there was a break here, because we the ring final circuit uh, uh, um, uh, method is at the same voltage as this conductor. So this won't occur, this won't cause an arc because it's the same voltage. You need a difference in voltage to actually, uh, for an arc to jump. So series arcs are not possible on a ring final circuit. And that's why people say they don't work on ring final circuits, but that's just for series arcs. Okay, so there are other arcs, of course. This one over here is a parallel arc. So imagine now there's someone's drilled into the wall or there's some, for whatever reason, there's some insulation damage now between this conductor and this conductor. Okay, now that will, um, they will operate at different voltages, of course. And so arc current is possible between the, the line and neutral conductors in a parallel arc fashion. So that will cause a lower resistance point between uh, these two conductors, okay, and at the point before it becomes a short circuit, of course, remember that there's that kind of space in the middle between good uh, resistance and short circuit. In this space in the middle, arcs are possible. So this could generate an arc. And uh, if an arc current is somewhere 2.5 amps or so, um, that's when that's one of the kind of thresholds that AFDDs look for. So again, to avoid all this unwanted tripping, it kind of ignores small arcs that are not going to cause a problem. Only when they become dangerous arcs will it will they will they uh, do something about disconnecting that circuit. And the dangerous threshold is when the arc current is a 2.5 amps or bigger. So at that point, the AFDD trip. But this is, these are both the cables in the walls, you know, the cables are all in containment, they're, they're kind of stable, they're not very prone to damage, of course. But this third one here is why we've chosen socket outlets. You know, this cable is now outside of the wall, it's down someone's garden, it's, you know, across someone's carpet in, in, in the cupboard or somewhere like that, under someone's work papers or whatever it is. So if this cable got damaged, okay, so this is now kind of a radial section. So if a series arc or parallel arc occurred on this cable here from the socket outlet, and even actually if a series or parallel arc occurred inside this equipment to a certain level, depends on what kind of equipment it is, of course, whether it's AC, DC, et cetera. Okay, so the AFDD will see arcing occurring after the socket outlet and the flexible cable and to a certain degree inside that equipment. So whether that arc be series or, or parallel, the AFDD, once it hits its parameters, you know, once it does its analyzing and it hits the kind of the 2.5 amp parameter, I guess, um, it will then um, see that as a problem and, and disconnect that circuit and stop that from catching fire. So yes, they do work on ring final circuits. They very much do work on ring final circuits. There's also some consideration or concerns with um, uh, XLPE uh, cable. So does this, uh, mitigate the need for AFDDs. Well, protection by the AFDDs doesn't really rely on the cable. Yes, XLPE or even some LSF cable um, is less prone to arcs. We have to kind of uh, be perfectly um, uh, okay with that theory, of course. They're less prone to arcs. Okay, but, you know, we don't always use uh, LSF or XLPE cable, of course. So whatever the cable medium, if there was an arc in it, it will detect that and do something about that. Several pictures from uh, uh, the Beamer Guide on AFDD shows several issues where um, arcing could have degenerated into a fire. Some of them have, of course, um, and, and there's obviously been some uh, burnouts on low. So whatever the cable medium in these that would have, um, uh, AFDDs would have done something about these, uh, these, these issues. And really the, again, the, the kind of confusion comes about because of the testing methods that the standard 62606 uses. Um, the standard, the, the method in the standard to generate the arc does use PVC cable. PVC is the most common cable 
used, of course, you know, just about every appliance we use has PVC cable connected to it. It's not possible for us to go to, I don't know, Curry's or whatever store we want to use and buy an uh, appliance, uh, some kind of a vacuum cleaner, laptop cable, or something like that, that does not have PVC cable on it. It has PVC cable on the flexible cord. So that's why they've chosen PVC cable as the test method. So um, they work uh, better with PVC cable only because PVC cable um, does kind of carbonize a lot better than the LSF cable, but it works on any cable. Now, what does someone have to do when they install AFDDs? Okay, we didn't really as a manufacturer want it to be an extra job for someone. So um, if someone's putting an AFDD in instead of an RCBO, for example, what extra work do they do you guys have to do? Well, first of all, let's talk about insulation resistance. Now, insulation resistance was slightly changed in Amendment 2, whereby a 500 volt insulation resistance test is required. Now, the text used in, used in Amendment 2 says, if equipment is going to influence that result or be damaged, okay, which more likely electronic equipment could be damaged if you inject 500 volt voltage into it, you should apply that test prior to connection of such equipment. So, AFDDs, really, okay, we could give instructions so that you don't connect up the AFDD, you actually apply the 500 volt on the cables before you connect to the AFDD and that will be a uh, that will be been a good instruction and that maybe had been sensible okay but we at Hager know that's going to be um, a problem okay we know that someone at some time more than one person probably in fact is going to wire it up okay and then stick the probes into the terminal of the AFDD and inject 500 volts so we know that's going to happen so what we've built into ours is the resilience to actually survive a 500 volt test so you can 500 volt test our AFDDs in the same way actually that you can 500 volt test our latest edition of our RCBOs where they have this kind of a little blue sticker on our RCBOs saying the installation resistance test is uh, is safe to do with this product. Okay, there is conditions, however. So um, the condition is that the device must not be in the on position. So unfortunately, you can't do like kind of the global insulation resistance test as such. The, the AFDD, if we're going to stick the probes into the outgoing terminals, like the picture shows, does need to be in the off position. Okay, less and less chance of doing global tests anyway. You know, even RCBOs, you know, you can't test on the incoming side. You can only test on the outgoing terminals. So there's less and less opportunity of the global or the whole distribution board insulation resist anyway so just make sure the switch is in the opposition and there's no problem and the secondary issue is uh, you must not press the, the very small test button on the AFDD now I don't think anyone's ever going to do that okay but just for completeness I need to mention it so certainly the off switch in your position do not press the actual manual test button on the AFDD when you're doing the uh, uh, insulation resistance test at 500 volts and there'll be absolutely no problem you actually will not be reading backwards into the AFDD if you did not do either of those things. So you, the, your 500 volts is not getting to the electronic test board as such, uh, as long as you do not do either of those two things. Now, this is a Hager thing. So uh, check with your other manufacturer, of course. So don't take that as a, as a global thing. Every manufacturer, you can do a 500 volt test because certainly I've not checked every manufacturer. Some can, I know, uh, but not all can, I know as well. And at the IR test, of course, following the connection of equipment, then you have to do that 250 volt test between live and earth, okay? You can switch the AFDD on now if you want to, there's no earth connection to it, you won't damage it at 250 volts anyway. So that's perfectly acceptable to do with uh, just about anyone's product. Maybe as long as it's not got a functional earth on it, actually. I've seen some AFDDs with the kind of the, the white or cream functional earth. Okay, that still might be a problem doing the 250 volt test between live conductors connected together to earth if it has a you know that white lead functional earth so again check with your manufacturer the other test you that we need to involve a afdd of course is the loop test now the zs test will never damage a product of course you just carry current through it okay uh, it depends how you do that test whether or not it may trip the product but certainly if you use the kind of the low current 
excuse me, or the no current, no, sorry, no trip setting of your um, test instrument, you won't trip the AFDD. Uh, you may uh, have an RCD in the circuit as well, or there's a pretty good chance actually you'll have an RCD in the circuit as well. So you'd have to do it by the low current test method anyway, and that, that AFDD will absolutely be fine for that. So there's absolutely, you know, for testing purposes, there's actually nothing for, uh, for you guys to do in, in installation resistance testing. Again, just remember if it's certainly the Hager one switched off or the, uh, or the loop testing you might do. So what about the actual test of the product itself? What do we have to do to actually test that the AFDD works? So actually nothing. OK, you do, there's no instrument test that tests uh, an AFDD today. OK, it's not necessary to be fair. So there's no there's no instrument test required. So as part of the standard, the AFDD must have a manual or automatic test function or both. Now, just about every manufacturer I know does have a both uh, function. So it's a both an automatic and a manual test function. If there is a manufacturer that I've not uh, seen that does have just a manual, just an automatic, okay, that's fine. It still complies with the standard, but most have both. Most have a little tiny button on them and most do an automatic test function. Now the automatic test function actually initiates a test sequence every time you switch it on and at least once every day, once every 24 hours. So every single day, this device is an electrical installation as long as it's got the automatic test function on them, our one does. Uh, our one is one that's got both functions on, uh, and, and I think most other manufacturers do. Every single day, this device will test itself to make sure it is still doing its, uh, it, it can still do its job, of course. And only if a malfunction is detected in itself will it trip. Okay, so if at some day it does its automatic test, and for whatever reason, I'm not sure what that reason will be, of course, there is a malfunction, it will trip off, okay? And it will indicate that it has failed its self-test, if you like. The last thing we want to be doing, of course, is if it didn't tell us, it's a, it's a, it's a self-test failure, we'll be around the installation maybe for several hours looking for something that isn't there, okay? The actual device is failed. So, you know, we, we need to be told that. So, you know, the standard says it has to tell us if it's actually fouled itself. Well, we'll look at how it does that in a sec. Okay, but that's a requirement of the standard. So what will we suggest? First installation, of course. Okay, wire it up. Okay, you know, do all your dead tests you need to do. And then once you've switched it on, press the test button. Okay, does it trip? If you press the test button, that's the manual test facility. The, man the, the manual test facility should trip it, of course, so that you know it's actually done the uh, done the sequence of tests and tripped pretty much like the RCBO test does. So, you know, most actually, in fact, most um, AFDDs are RCBOs as well. So they have a, you've got to press the test button because it's an RCBO. There's generally only one test button on them. You know, we, we, we like to use these one module products, so they're very small. Um, fitting two test buttons on it would be awkward. So, you know, we, manufacturers have just put one test button that tends to test the RCD function or the RCBO function and the AFDD function at the same time. And as I said, the device should trip and indicate that it's a manual operation now that it's disconnected, not an automatic operation that's detected. And of course the RCD, if it is an RCDO, RCDO, RCBO, of course you have to do your uh, instrument tests on the RCBO part. So you don't do an instrument test on the AFDD part, you just do your instrument test on the uh, on the RCBO part of the product or the RCD part of the product, which, as we know now, is a very short test. It's only a one times test you need to do now anyway. And on AC function as well. So although the uh, RCD technology inside is type A, um, so you only need to do that test at AC uh, setting on your machine, not type A. So is there literally anything that anyone has to do once they've installed AFDDs? Well, um, I've just pulled up the generic schedule of test results and the uh, minor installation work certificate on the screen there, or section of anyway. There's a, a tick box at the end of here to say that you have initiated the manual test function of the AFDD. There is a little note there, of course, uh, not of course, obviously. there is a little note there and underneath it will say not all uh, our AFDDs have a manual test function because if you remember from the last screen, they don't have to have a manual test function. Just about everyone does, okay? So if it does, so press the button and tick that box. Now, again, most AFDDs are also RCBOs. So you'll be ticking 
that box, because you press the button for the RCD, there isn't a secondary button, the AFDD, so you'll be ticking that box as well. So that's literally the only extra work that anyone's going to be asked to do is tick that secondary box, or if it's a, a minor installation works you're doing, tick that box as well if it's got a, a menu button on there. So, okay, there's little or nothing for anyone to do by installing AFDDs. Now, AFDDs have onboard diagnostics, which is really useful because there's actually several reasons now for this product to trip. You know, it's not only overcurrent, it's not only residual current, there's several other reasons now for this thing to trip. So um, the last trip or, or every manufacturer gives you some kind of diagnostics to tell you why it's tripped. There's different um, um, sequences, I guess, or different colors used. Um, it is unfortunate that color sequence isn't in the British standard. It would have been useful. That means if it was in the British standard, everyone would have to use the same kind of fault codes, if you like. But because it's not in there, manufacturers can choose to give you as much or as little information as they wish to give you with different colors, with different flashes or whatever it is. So in our one, OK, we have this um, uh, little LED window on it. OK, and the actual little test button um, has got a second function here. So once it's tripped, if it's in the off position, OK, what we do not suggest is you turn it back on again because, you know, if it's tripped under fault conditions, OK, the not really a good idea to switch it back onto a fault that the reason why it's tripped off to find out what the fault was because the fault's still there and it might trip off again so there's no need to re-energize the device following it trip so all we need to do in, in our one in the off position is press this blue test button again okay so it's got a second function if you like with this button and it will identify one of eight statuses um, by color um, as they come up so the eight statuses actually I'm going to press one too many, I know it would. So the eight, state, the eight states is here, two of them are on or, on or off. Okay, so maybe ignore those. Okay, there's, so there's six kind of fault codes, if you like. So as we press that button, if we saw this kind of flashing red and amber, it will tell us that it's tripped because of a series arc fault. If it just flashes red, it's a parallel arc fault. If it's just amber, okay, it uh, tells you it's tripped on over voltage. Okay, these things are... Um, over voltage protection devices as well. That's not surge protection over voltage, that's a sustained over voltage. So if there's a sustained over voltage of something like 275 volts, this thing would disconnect to protect equipment that's going to get damaged maybe by that excess voltage. And the others as well, residual current fault. Now this is the one, if you remember, this, this flashing amber one. If it does do this daily, or actually our, for our product, an hourly self-test, and um, fouls, okay, it must trip itself off and indicate that it's self-test that's fouled. So it will flash yellow to save you the bother now of going around spending hours looking for a fault that's not there. And the uh, red green flashing means it's overload or short circuit or it's been manually tripped. So the overload, the overcurrent part of the product is, um, is disconnected. So it's like a, a short circuit on MCB trip as such. Yeah. So, you know, that gives us a good idea about the, the last reason why it trips. So we know somewhere to go by using the fault color codes. There is a little sticker that, that provided with a product. It's kind of a um, little, in inverted commas actually, is a really little sticker um, uh, that we, we provide. You can put it underneath the, uh, underneath the AFDD or somewhere on the consuming it if you wish. Okay, so um, the amendment two allows us not to put so many stickers on it, but you can tuck it away somewhere underneath the cover. It's that small actually, uh, if you want to uh, just give us some indication about, you know, the, the fault codes process of, of the AFDD. So um, the um, AFDDs do have some real, we're getting some real history now actually. And then this is the, this is one that, that occurred um, a short while ago from uh, one of our customers. Uh, and this is a, an Instagram post, actually. Um, AFDD saved us from a fire. So this guy um, put AFDDs. I spoke to this chap, actually. It was actually in his own home. Uh, and the AFDD was tripping, which, OK, we said, well, this is a nuisance. Why is this happening? But then on later investigation, he fact, actually, actually there's something wrong with his, uh, with his washing machine, actually. And there was a, an issue which could have could have uh, started a fire 
um, you know, and you know what we do with washing machines, then we, we put them on at night time, we put them on when we're out and things like that. So it could have actually started a fire in his machine um, and this AFDD pretty much did its job and actually um, stopped that from occurring. It's, um, this guy changed the AFDD and actually then now it's working perfectly okay. Now, the fault code is useful, okay? It tends to only give us the last fault code. Um, so what you can do actually, or what we've done, uh, is use uh, an app, you know? We, we use app for all sorts of things these days. So um, you can download this Hager Pilot app, and as part of it, it's got some kind of extra diagnostics in for AFDDs, very, very useful. So once you call on up the app, you can look up um, the fault codes again. Okay, this is easy to read, of course, it's on your phone rather than a, a tiny little sticker that might be on the consumer unit. There is a little um, something behind that as such. So if it was a parallel arc, let's say it's blinking red as such. Okay, if we touch that part on our screen, you get some kind of a what to do kind of things. Uh, maybe useful, maybe not, I guess. If someone is um, um, looking to fault find, of course, then really they probably would know what to do if they see some kind of a Parallel arc means there's a fault between live conductors as such. So I know I've got to do uh, look at insulation resistance values and things like that. Now, what is probably more useful, to be fair, is this history. So we have a, um, um, an event history, if you like, and this will tell us the last 16 reasons this device was tripped. The onboard diagnostics with LED are good, but they only tell us the last one. Okay, so it'll be useful to actually know what the last one before that was, and before that was, before that was, et cetera. And probably they're all going to be the same, aren't they? Because, you know, the same fault would probably keep tripping it. So we would expect to see, you know, um, parallel arc fault, parallel arc fault, parallel arc fault, parallel arc fault. So every time they're switching it back on, you know, the, the, the arc has kind of been extinguished and then it starts up again at some point or the equipment has been removed. And when it gets plugged in again, you know, there's that faulty equipment or take the washing machine example. It's not used all the time, of course. So when it's not running, there's no fault there. So it, there's only a, a fault every time something happens. So we can use this information to analyze what the last 16 fault was, faults were on this, uh, on this circuit. Okay, and that will obviously help us as well with doing uh, lots of the, uh, uh, the fault finding, uh, the, the, what's causing the AFDD to, to trip. And this is actually a third function of that little blue test button actually. So our little blue test button has got a, uh, a manual test facility. It initiates the fault codes and obviously also to connect to the product, it activates the Bluetooth chip we've got in the product as well. So we can actually talk to it and connect to it and find out what the, uh, the fault history was in the AFDD. Now, another potential problem with AFDDs, I guess, is the way they work, okay, because they work is uh, this is programming that makes them kind of ignore naturally occurring arcs and only pick up in uh, what it knows as a dangerous arc. So that's fine today. So that avoids unwanted tripping. Okay, but you know, we expect AFDD to be in someone's consuming or distribution board for several years. You know, what's a, a lifetime of electrical installation is pretty much deemed to be 25 years. So if in 15, 20 years time, what is the chances of something coming onto our market that we haven't thought of today? You know, did we've seen digital motors and things like that where these weren't thought of 10 years ago. Um, so if something enters our market, Dyson, Samsung, some of these really innovative people, Apple, I don't know who else, um, brings out something in 15 years time, which the AFDD due to its programming doesn't know today, there is a there is a chance it could give the AFDD a problem because it doesn't know how it operates today. And if it doesn't know how it operates today, it's not built into its algorithm. So it might see it as a, a potential threat, if you like, a potential fault, uh, arc fault, and disconnect. And we don't want it to do that, of course. It's just how the machine works. It just works different to it does today. So there is... Um, um, possibilities to upgrade the actual product itself. So we've built into our facilities or into our FDDs because we can connect to it, okay, we can talk to it, we can update it in the same way as we update our phones regularly, okay, we can update this thing just as regularly, okay, it's a really, really easy process. We can update it, 
take this new signature, okay, we'll take the new signature, pull it into our product, put it into the app, and the app can just talk to the product and update it, simple. So when you connect to an AFDD, once we've uh, connected to it, it will give us some information of the product. So here's the product information, it tells us its part number, it tells us its rating, et cetera, et cetera. And it tells us what software's in it, okay? And if it's the, uh, it's not the latest version of software, you know, like, like phones do and things like that, it gives us the option to update. So we simply press that blue button, blue button, press that orange button, okay? And it will take a, a minute or two and update its firmware. So, you know, we might get in 10 years time, new products come to the marketplace um, that work in a different way to they do today. We as a manufacturer will take that signature, make it available in the app, so uh, AFDDs can be uh, simply updated and not need to be replaced. Okay, the ones that can't be updated, of course, okay, their process of, uh, uh, of doing this will actually have to update the ones in the factory. Okay, and actually updating the ones in the factory means you have to change products in installations, which is not what we want, uh, we want to happen, just update the product. Why not? And there's also some, okay, after a certain period of time, of course, you could get the update history from the product. Um, it's there if you need it, okay. Um, not sure if I can think of a reason why you need it, of course, but yeah, you, you know, as long as you know it's on the latest version of the software, that's all you need to do, so. And obviously that will save us time and some issues uh, if we do suspect a fault in, uh, in the years to come. So um, William Fu Senate will be, uh, after the webinar will be giving you some links to some um, documentation around AFDDs, of course. Uh, there's, there's documentation around AFDDs on their own, or there's documentation around uh, Amendment 2 guides that we have as well, which are updated to include the core agenda. So watch out for this as part of the feedback from the webinar. And our webinar schedule is um, Pretty much monthly so you can see there's the schedule of october november or september october november december paul hopefully paul will be joining me in the next one so the next one is on september the first which is to do with surge protection devices hopefully see as many as you there as we can and all the subsequent webinars as well of course and uh, i'll introduce my colleague paul to you on the, on that webinar hopefully Thank so, you so much, thanks Paul. Thanks so much for yeah. your uh, attention. That would have been uh, a good sign off for myself and Paul there, but uh, uh, it's just myself. So um, I'll take some questions. I don't, Paul can't take these, I guess, either. So hopefully I'll, uh, I'll be able to answer these. Yeah, thank you so much, Paul, for this insightful uh, presentation. Hopefully next time we'll be able to get Paul. So we got a couple of questions. Um, I'll start with one. In houses with sub-mains or commercial premises, would it be acceptable to install the IFDD on distribution circuit, thereby protecting the whole of the sub-mains, or are they required to be installed on final circuits only? No, final circuits only. Two reasons for that, really. One to do with um, subdividing installation, convenience, etc., and from 314. And they are, they, uh, there's a, um, a note, it's not a note, it's a regulation that says they have to be on the origin of the circuit to be protected. So uh, they, they kind of, each circuit is, is important for uh, AFDDs. They, own, they tend to only go up to somewhere around about 32 amp current rating anyway. Um, and they're small like uh, MCB, uh, RCBO product. So um, the, the product doesn't really exist to go on um, distribution circuits. Okay, we won't, won't want to see it on a distribution circuit anyway, so final circuits. Thank you. Uh, so just a reminder, um, if you have any questions, you can pop them in the chat box and Paul uh, can address them. So we have one more uh, from Graham. Um, if the HRRB has separate unlinked stair cores, should the flats in the stair core that doesn't go above 18 meters require IFDDs? Um, so, yeah, sorry, I think I understood that question. So if it's a HRRB, a high risk residential building, um, the, the regulations require the building sockets to be uh, AFDD protected, not, the, not just the residential units of the HRRB to be AFDD protected. So it doesn't matter what use that socket was, if it's in a building that fits that category of over 
six storeys or over 18 metres, and is a residential building, of course, not an office block. Okay, all the sockets, be the cleaner sockets, landlord sockets, even really if there's a commercial unit on the ground floor, if it's shops and flats above, all those sockets would also require uh, protection by AFDD because the regulations say that sockets in the building, not sockets in the residential parts of that particular building. Uh, one more question. Do we have to fit IFDDs to an existing hostel? Oh, hostel. What is the, what do you mean, uh, what's the definition of hostel? Uh, hostel isn't, wouldn't fall under any of those uh, definitions. So uh, if it was a, um, I'm thinking in my mind, hopefully I'm matching that, that particular guy who asked that question, like a kind of a youth hostel or something like that. That is not a residential building, you know, that, that's not a, uh, a, a HMO, that is not student accommodation, that is not mm -hmm. a, a, you know, a, um, a care home. So uh, mm -hmm. for me, no. So they'd fall under the recommended part now. So they'd be recommended, yes. So someone should make some decision, uh, okay, am I going to use them because they're recommended or for what reason am I not going to use them? We have more questions popping up. Uh, we can take one more and then the rest of the questions we can um, contact you by email. Um, yeah. So yes, we, would welding equipment work on, on an AFDD? Yeah, that's, that's a, a really good question. That's one that, um, um, that we had to ask um, uh, about product designers actually because arc welding equipment obviously creates an arc. Surely an AFDD We'll see that as an arc and disconnect it okay but it, in its program okay in its algorithms okay even even welding equipment okay it, it knows that's going to happen okay i'm not entirely sure of the uh, you know the actual software uh, system how it knows that happens of course um, but it knows that's occurring and it actually will not disconnect that because it knows it's supposed to happen Okay, uh, it's just one thing. So James, who asked about the hostel, said, sorry, it's a student accommodation. Student accommodation, the yes. Wel welding equipment, yeah. okay. Yeah, Great. Student, accommoda if it's student accommodation, that if it's purpose-built student accommodation, then mm -hmm. yes, socket outlets have to be AFDD protected. Brilliant. Thank you so much again, Paul. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, this is a CPD accredited webinar, so we'll be sending you the certificates um, in the next few weeks. Uh, please contact us again if you haven't received uh, your certificate. Uh, we're looking forward to get to have you in the next webinars as well. We have many lined up. Um, again, if you have any inquiries or recommendations, please uh, email us at marketing at rexel.co.uk um, and we'll be seeing you soon. Thank you so much, Paul, again. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.